so this is the new year and I don't feel any different. Yes, folks, we are officially kicking off 2024 with some classic, classic Death Cab for Cutie lyrics. Hello and happy new year. Welcome <laughs> to the very first 2024 edition of the Reason Roundtable. I am Peter Suderman filling in for Matt Welch, who is busy eating frogs. Today, I'm joined by Roundtable regular Catherine Mangu Ward, as well as special guests Elizabeth Nolan Brown and Zach Weissmuller. Everyone say hello. Howdy New Year. Hi, Happy New Year. Hi. Happy Tuesday. So I've already said Happy New Year, but it does seem like some people are not, in fact, feeling very happy about the passage of time. For example, Here are just a couple of the headlines that ran on our very own Reason.com recently. The Year of Bad Vibes by Liz Wolf, in which Liz wrote about how in 2023, statists had their way with us all, making many things a little less fun and free in the process. And then there was Matt Welch, who before exiting stage left, gave us this hopeful, uplifting headline. Prediction 2024 will see deadly political violence in the streets. Credit to Matt Welch, he does not bury the lead. Welch's post was largely about the current highly charged political environment and the particular way that election years make people extra special crazy. His post included the following burst of rhetorical sunshine from the man who is currently the leading contender for the GOP presidential nomination, Donald Trump. I'm going to try and read this all in one breath. Merry Christmas to all, including crooked Joe Biden's only hope deranged Jack Smith, the out-of-control lunatic who just hired outside attorneys fresh from the swamp, unprecedented to help him with his poorly executed witch hunt against Trump and MAGA, included also our world leaders, both good and bad, but none of which are as evil and sick as the thugs we have inside our country who, with their open borders, inflation, Afghanistan surrender, green news scam, high taxes, no energy independence, woke military, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Iran, all electric car lunacy, and so much more. There's more somehow. Are looking to destroy our once great USA. May they rot in hell again. Merry Christmas. I think that was like eight breaths. Yes, that was that was more breaths than I intended. But I think you guys get the idea there. Merry Christmas, right? That's that's Happy New Year. Uh, So I want to I want to take that and then just check (laughs) the mood here. Um, I want to go around the panel and see what is your personal sense of of the coming year on a scale of one to 10, with one being global Armageddon and 10 being total anarcho-libertopia where large dogs live forever. Uh, we are gonna keep this th- this pretty simple and call this segment Happy News Year. Catherine, let's start with you. Listen, politics is gonna be bad this year. Um, I was doing some you know, year end reflecting some, I don't really do like resolutions for myself exactly, but like pondering the year to come. And I, and I, I just decided like, this is the year that I'm going to take Chris Fryman's advice and remember, uh, as he wrote in Reason Magazine a while back, that it is okay to ignore politics. Um, I recognize that will be intention with my full time job, but that you can you can like emotionally... I'm going to remind you of that when I don't know what's going on in the news someday. Yeah. And you're like, Peter, why aren't you writing about the news? Like there are part there are parts of policies that will be interesting and important. I plan to engage with those. But uh, I do think this year you are right that and Matt is right and Liz is right. It's, it's the vibes are going to be bad, but I don't necessarily actually think the policy will be that bad this year. Joe Biden will continue Joe Bidening. It's going to be not good Joe Bidening type policy. I, I anticipate it that it will basically roughly match the bad policy of the last three years, which was, I think, like it's a muddle through. It's a five ish. That's where we are. I think there will be less terrible new spending this year just because Congress isn't going to do anything. Uh, Zach, how about you? Um, oh, wait, Catherine, uh, before we uh, before we go to Zach, one to ten global Armageddon or Isn't large five-ish. dogs live forever. I'm, I'm going with five ish. Uh, and but okay. I think every year is a five ish. All right. Every year. is a I want to give you like a, we're just here muddling through. We're doing our best. It's it is what it is. Uh, Zach. I'm going to rank it a solid four. Um, I think we've been slowly escaping the high two to mid three range that we hit <laughs> during the depths of the COVID pandemic and kind dark, of guys. crawling our way towards a five. But given the insane election year that we're all guaranteed, I'm going to deduct a point and put us at a four. Liz? Um, five. Just like Catherine said, I think most years are are fives. You know, we 
things pretty much just I, I'm of the like things pretty much just stay the same camp. Um, I also agree with Catherine that like the vibes are going to be really bad because of uh, the election. But also, I mean, that that's going to actually maybe give us less terrible policy than we would have in a, in a normal year because, you know, people are so consumed with that, that they're not as, as consumed with like making up terrible things to do um, in, in Congress and in state houses. So, you know, those two things cancel each other out and, and we, we come to a five. All right. So we have two fives and a four. Our average here is something like a 4.75. And I was I was when uh, we started today. I was gonna give this a five, and you know what? I'm not. I'm I'm changing my this answer. This is like when you go to the restaurant and everyone orders the same thing, and then you have to change your order. You don't have to change your order if it's a five. I it's am a five. changing my order because you cannot have everyone order Negronis. Somebody has to order uh, a, a daiquiri here, Mezcal and you know. Negroni. And and yeah, right, you, you, you can't have everybody uh, do the same thing, right? So I do think the threat of serious political chaos is very real th- this year, and it worries me. But I also think we are on the cusp of some pretty exciting stuff that will make the world much better. And that once we get past the current political quagmire, the ne- next wave of political discourse uh, is going to be much more interesting and more invigorating. So I'm going to give this year a seven. That's my vibe. Um, wow. And we're gonna we're gonna muddle through, but it's gonna be it's gonna be okay. Um, uh, so I want to now move on to something a little more specific beyond the vibes. Uh, let's do some predictions. What concretely do you expect to happen in 2024? Um, so I want everyone to make one 2024 prediction about politics or governance or policy. And then one about culture, tech, everything else, just something in the non-politics realm. Catherine, again, let's start with you. I am feeling um, optimistic about the year for marijuana policy. And uh, that is despite the uh, strong thread of I can smell the marijuanas in the streets, which tells me it is global Armageddon, uh, like think piece genre that is existing in the world right now. Um a new poll came out uh, just recently showing that we are now at 70 percent uh, of uh, the public that thinks that marijuana should be legal. And um, that's true. in like every group is basically in favor. So 91 uh, percent of self-identified liberals support legal marijuana, but 52 percent of self-identified conservatives do also. So m- we are over the tipping point, even for people who identify th- themselves as conservatives to pollsters. Um, the olds also 64 percent in favor. Um, I just think that we're going to keep seeing progress right before the end of the year. Biden expanded the list of crimes that were um, subject to some federal pardons. So um, uh, this is just a very narrow subset of people, people who um were on you know federal lands or in Washington D.C. when they committed mostly possession or intent to possess type crimes, but still, um, that's progress. So I am optimistic about the marijuana policy, even though there is a kind of um, chattering class backlash occurring. Zach, what do you predict in the realm of politics and in the realm of culture and technology and everything else? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, on the political side, I am expecting to see another major speech suppression push online, similar to the kind of suppression, blacklisting, manipulation of discourse that we saw during COVID. I think that's going to happen again in the run up to the election. Um, and I think it's going to look a lot different this time because A, with Elon Musk running X and taking a different approach to content moderation. I think the contrast with how that platform handles things is going to be a lot different than the other platforms. The the difference is likely to be rather striking, and that's good. We want a marketplace of platforms. Uh, And then there's also the looming Missouri v. Biden case at the Supreme Court, uh, which in the past I've interviewed one of the plaintiffs, Jay Bhattacharya, about that. Um, And that's going to help settle the question or at least give some more clarity on how far can the government go in terms of communicating and leaning on the tech companies, jawboning them into compliance to remove the kind of controversial but completely legal speech that uh, we saw happen throughout the pandemic. Um, So... That could very seriously rein in what I see as a 
disturbing and inappropriate level of meddling. But if there's one thing government bureaucracies are good at, it's self-preservation and figuring out loopholes to keep perpetuating their themselves and their agendas. So I do predict we'll see the speech police strike back with a vengeance this year. So that's the political side of things, the cultural and technological side of things. I predict that this is going to be the year Bitcoin goes mainstream. Um, and this is not investment advice. And I'm not sure why they would, would take it journalist investment advice anyway, but <laughs> more so I'm just noting that the uh, regulators are potentially going to approve a Bitcoin ETF as early as next week. And if that happens- Can you explain what of, that is in like two sentences? Sure. Uh, an exchange traded fund. So it'll essentially allow um, big institutions like Vanguard and BlackRock and Fidelity to hold uh Bitcoin, uh, something that reflects the value of Bitcoin. And so all the people who have their money and, you know, 401ks and IRAs there will be able to allocate some of their money into Bitcoin easily without having to have the technical know-how to actually self-custody their own Bitcoin. And, so in and some ways, Bitcoin is going to be more integrated into the traditional stock market. Precisely. And like the most interesting aspect of that to me isn't just, you know, number go up, but more so that it'll offer Bitcoin significant political protection with these large stakeholders now involved with it. And that's going to be helpful because we have politicians like Elizabeth Warren in the Senate gunning for crypto broadly, but I think also Bitcoin in particular, since it's the big boy, it's the OG. Um, and it's also just going to be an interesting turning point because uh, if you're someone who's never paid much attention to it, but now some percentage of your retirement or savings goes into it, then maybe that sparks some curiosity. And when you start to get curious and learn more about Bitcoin, you then start to learn more about the ideas of people like Mises and Hayek. And Bitcoin's created a lot of libertarians. So I'm hopeful that we'll see that trend accelerate in 2023. Are you worried at all that this might also kind of like immunitize the eschaton? Like when everything does go to hell, which it will, people will be mm -hmm. like, you know what the real problem was? Those Bitcoin ETFs. Like, you know, I, I have I have I sort of share your optimism generally, but I have this concern that somehow or another we're going to have a debt crisis caused by far too much federal spending. And then Elizabeth Warren will be like. It's because of Bitcoin. Right. Well, I think this is kind of like the marijuana stuff. It's like a whole bunch of stuff is kind of like wrong on the streets of our cities that clearly has to do with some like very major macro trends. But people are like, it smells like weed. It must be that. Like, are you worried, yes. Zach? I, what I I'm saying, I guess, that, is I'm worried. Yes, Should it, it I be does worried? worry me that there's going to be, you know, graphs of like some economic downturn with the line that shows Bitcoin ETF approved and it has you know nothing to do with it. Um, and also the other worrying thing that I've heard expressed in the Bitcoin community is that once it gets into integrated into the mainstream financial system, that there's going to be lobbying to only allow people to hold it through an ETF and they're going to go after self-custody and exchanges and so forth. So there are definitely ancillary concerns like that. Bitcoin at this point is fairly resilient and people are good at holding it in ways that are difficult for the government to stop. So I think it's proven itself fairly resilient. Um, but yeah, those, those are always legitimate concerns to hold in mind. I'm just excited for the eventual Warren coin. Uh, Liz, what are your two <laughs> predictions? Uh, in the policy realm um, that we're going to see, just it's going to be the year of age, bad age verification laws. Um, you know, mm. the laws saying that you have to be 13 or 16 or 18 in order to get on various social media sites or to, you know, use the internet more broadly in, in some cases of these legislation. Um, we've already seen a couple of states pass them. There's like a billion other states that are considering them at the moment. Um, I don't think that they'll go anywhere at the federal level, hopefully, um, but maybe that's overly optimistic. I definitely think we'll see more more states passing them. Um, and, and, you know, part of the, the way you can tell this is, is heating up in addition to the fact that, you know, politicians just keep introducing these laws, 
is that uh, Facebook, like my when I watch Hulu, it is nonstop meta ads that are asking for this regulation. It reminds me of that like parody Gadsden flag where it's got like the snake, the snake with the uh, ball gag in his mouth and someone's stepping on him and he's like, oh, please step on me. Like that's what, that's basically what these ads are. Facebook's just like, we think that you should regulate us and make us not, because, you know, obviously Facebook has the capacity to deal with, they, they did the same thing with Section 230. They have this capacity to deal with age verification laws or Section 230 being obliterated or whatever else it is. I mean, it'll be a burden for them. But they also have an much, influence much... operation in Washington that just means that because they are the biggest player, politicians are going to take their concerns, uh, even if they're not writing the legislation literally themselves or the regulations literally right. themselves. Politicians are going to take their concerns more seriously and think more about them than any other uh, you know, sort of upstart player that is not high on the minds of the folks who are, who are writing these laws and these rules. And that gives them an advantage in that they can shape the regulation, even if they're not you know, literally the ones in the rooms writing it. That means they can shape the regulation in ways that um, are going to be advantageous to their business model. Right, exactly. So, so they want it, and it's going to be a big pain for for much smaller tech companies. And also, as you know, we repeat a reason again and again. It's going to be just like absolutely privacy killing if this stuff does pass, which is like the secret reason that everyone wants it. It's not that you know, I mean, I I, I don't think most politicians are that concerned that your sixteen year old or eighteen year old is is you know looking at Instagram photos, but people want to be able to attach identity real identities to everyone on the internet, which is what happens with these laws. So that's why. That's why they are so popular, and um, we're just unfortunately going to have to be dealing with that. Um, seeing a lot of court cases too, hopefully smacking them down, as, as tends to happen with these things, but not before you know more and more places try them. Um, in the cultural realm, uh, I'm going to go with that. We're going to just see a lot more freakouts about um, sex and fertility and family size. Um, you know, all, all three of those things together as we can we do um this sometimes leads to like bad policy but more it's it's just general like uh you know just general freakouts like you have the conservatives running more you know we're gonna see more conservative magazines running articles that are like teenagers need to get knocked up in the backs of cars because uh babies which was actually like a real national review article um last month we're gonna see more people on uh, you know on the left being like uh it's because like the women are doing too much emotional labor and and you know all this stuff um and so i just think you know we're gonna see just it's both sides converging on these these narratives even though the left is like oh it's it's capitalism's fault and conservatives are like oh i don't know i mean i don't i don't even know where they're going with the teen sex thing but so the, also the liberals are, like, are oh, gonna end up generously. calling for an emotional labor union while the conservatives <laughs> are just going to be like, kids need to get back into cars. Yeah, I think exactly. driverless cars could be a boon for getting mm. teenagers knocked up in the back of cars, though. If you think about that, like uh, self-driving cars. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even have to have like a, a make out point or whatever. Right. In your town. And, you know, you, you can like, you can take the car out. A robot car. Exactly. You can take the car out, you know, younger. You can start your campaign to become a teen mom. <laughs> Before you have your license now. Technology so. yeah. will fix the fertility problem. Just as the founders <laughs> intended, the driverless cars will get the teens pregnant. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I guess I'll do my predictions then. Uh, so my political prediction is a two-part prediction. Uh, first is that Donald Trump and Joe Biden will be the Republican and Democratic presidential nominees. That's the first part of the prediction. And the second part of that prediction is that it's going to be awful. It's just gonna be soul crushing. What to your, where's your in seven every now, Suderman? Possible way. <laughs> <laughs> my my seven was a a momentary like a spark of hope that is gone already. Okay, twenty minutes into the podcast. Uh, no, it's 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 just gonna be miserable. Um, and in, like I said, soul crushing. Even I think if you don't even believe in a soul, uh, my cultural prediction uh, though is something a little more near and dear to my heart, which is I think people are going to go back to the movies in a big and surprising way. Even without a lot of big tentpole superhero movies coming, there is only one MCU film coming. There's a couple of like Spider Verse movies coming out from Sony, maybe. Uh, but really, this is going to be a year not quite totally without superhero movies, but without the glut of superhero movies that we have seen in the past couple of years, and we have already seen a, some of the signs of how that market is changing with films like Barbie and Oppenheimer overperforming this summer. But even over the holiday season where 
the Aquaman sequel kind of flopped. Uh, yet movies like Godzilla Minus One and The Boy and the Heron and even the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie uh, all did pretty good business relative to their budgets. And in the process, uh, we are going to find out what movies will look like in the next world once comic books no longer dominate and maybe once Joe Biden and Donald Trump are out of our political picture. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, is what what we learned and what we can apply. So in theory, as time passes, you get older and you also get smarter. You learn lessons. Um, and so for this one, I want everyone to talk about something we learned last year that could be put to use in the coming year. Now, this can be for you personally or for the nation or for some relevant subgroup, some, uh, some organized uh, class of people. What is one thing that was learned in the last year that could or should be applied to make 2024 better? How are we going to achieve progress? Catherine, let's start with you. AI is the thing that I thought about in 2023 that's going to be relevant in 2024. Is it progress? Is it uh, chaos? Is it all of the above? I'm not 100% sure yet. I do think um, this is the last presidential election cycle that isn't um, significantly impacted by AI. This is uh, to AI what 2008 was to social media? A well, so or 2004 I was, maybe? I was going to say like, you know... You remember we we're old enough to remember some of us on this podcast. This is an entire podcast of elder millennials, by the way. Gosh, <laughs> speak for yourself. Um, I'm Gen X, and <laughs> that's how it is. Uh, the um, we are old enough to remember the election that the internet started to matter. Remember when the internet yeah. was like a, a thing that people on. CNN were like, mm, this candidate is better at the internet and that might help him win. Like that was a thing that people said. And I think that um, people are mostly just screwing around with AI right now at the consumer level. Um, and, you know, typically political campaigns lag the private sector um, and also just kind of like private uses generally. But um, this is this is the last time that we will have um, maybe all human candidates for president. I'm not sure. <laughs> Depends on how quickly things accelerate, like paging Ray Kurzweil to answer that question, I guess. But, um, you know, we're going to we're going to see like we're going to see a little bit of that. But what I learned is that um, in 2023, a lot of people tried to get a handle on this issue and failed. Like there's just a lot of people trying to get a framework, trying to plug it into something they already believe, trying to make it align with their pre-existing values. I think in 2024, that's going to continue. I hope that that's going to continue because if people do manage to somehow align this to just like red, blue America or whatever, um, it's going to make the whole conversation stupider and um, and less productive. I think 2024, we should learn that like AI doesn't fit in the boxes and just try to go from there. Wait, AI is libertarian? AI is libertarian, Peter. Well, Maybe. It's... Or... It's going to disrupt the two-party system. It's the end of human freedom. I don't know. One of the two. We'll find so out. No one else like, knows I, either. Do you have any set ideas as like, like any predictions as how how AI might affect political discourse? Because I'm just imagining like I, that that moment in that debate keeps popping into my head when um, uh, Christie called Vivek Ramaswamy like ChatGPT. Um, and it's like, is that what it, how it's going to manifest is we're going to see candidates like this who... They just feel like their teleprompter is just filled with uh, LLM like generated text. Uh, yes. And yeah, because yeah. I think it's we okay. already understand that lots of political speech is filler text. It's just, you know, the words you have to say between, you know, evoking a couple of key feelings or ideas. And so for sure, all of that text will be written by uh, chatbots of various kinds quite soon. I, and and I if that won't gonna, even be a scandal. I mean, right? I, I like, think it's going to enter into our politics in a more concrete way than that, uh, though some of that for right, sure. Right, but I mean, but in we terms will have, of the, we are going to have debates about regulating AI generally, debates right. about regulating AI drugs and how fast we need to test, you know, uh, do the testing there. But also, I hope, frankly, that we are going to have some debates about using AI to make government work better, because the thing that AI is really good at is pattern recognition. And government does a lot of stuff that that is that can be subject to pattern analysis. And AI might show us places where there are perhaps some inefficiencies. Yeah, no, for sure to all of that. But I also think Zach is right that an a, a undervalued thing or like an interesting thing that's going to happen is like our politicians are going to start to sound more alike like 
Donald Trump already sounds like a tweet that was generated by an AI that was told to generate a tweet in the style of Donald Trump. And I think that there's just going to be more and more of that until we have a kind of like convergence of uh, of political rhetoric that is very different than like how, how politicians all sound headlines now. in 2016 were the same and you'll never guess what donald trump just said what crazy <laughs> thing right Takira. that was actually a very very yes. early example of basically uh what is now accelerating uh, but i think for the most part this election cycle will only see glimmers of it and it's not till the next one that that blows up all right so what uh what thing did we learn in 2023 that we could use to make 2024 better liz nolan brown let's go to you so one just minor life hack I want to say is you guys know they make little tiny colanders that go over the tops of cans. So you can just <laughs> drain the can without having to like pour stuff out. And it's just the most amazing product. Yay, capitalism. That exists. I think everyone should know that. It's my best discovery of, of 2023. Wait. I did say um, that it could be a personal life lesson. I don't understand. I'm going to do, do a real one too, but I just needed to tell people that. Is it like a little shower cap? Yeah. Yeah, and it just like fits on like a can of beans or something, so you can just pour it upside down without having to hold it on. Wow, it's it's brilliant. Everyone Better should look for these. They sell them on Amazon. Better bean technology. Okay, <laughs> I would expect no less from our Ohio correspondent. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I'm basically like advertising Tupperware here, uh, but I I think um, one thing is that you know. A lot of times we have old laws on the books and we think like whatever, those haven't been enforced for decades or maybe they haven't been enforced for a century. So like no big deal. And uh, that can reverse. And we've seen that with the Comstock law, which is the terrible law against um, mailing, you know, things that can be you marry, mailing uh, paraphernalia about birth control or, um, you know, abortion, uh, tools of abortion or other sort of things that can be used for immoral purposes and, um, you know, passed, passed in the Victorian area. Um, and and it's, it was just sort of like terrible, but then people stopped using it and it was just like, okay, whatever, we'll just leave that on the books. It's, it's there, but it doesn't matter because nobody's going to enforce it. And now we're seeing, um, a lot of like, it, it play into a lot of these court decisions over abortion bans with a lot of conservative groups being like, well, you know, we should, um, we should, you know, do this because the Comstock law is still there. Um, and we've seen that to, to, for a lesser degree with like a lot of these really old abortion bans that have been on the laws for for like 100 or more years that were just like dormant. And now um, after after Dobbs, they came back. But I think the Comstock law is the big one because it just it felt like such a thing that was just like a historical relic that nobody was going to revive. And and now everybody's trying to revive it. So um, I think the lesson is that, you know, we, we should actually repeal bad old laws, even if they're, you know, people think like, oh, that's just a funny old timey thing no one will no one will want to use it again because um you never know what's going to happen and they could repeal bad laws always a, a good lesson to learn zach what do you have uh one thing i think we learned in 2023 was that uh javier malay in argentina taught us that an unapologetic charismatic libertarian can win the presidency mm. under certain extreme conditions such as triple digit inflation and a collapsing economy. And what I hope we can learn from this is let's not get to that point before taking some of these key libertarian insights seriously. Like let's not let the debt spiral out of control. We're, we're already at the, you know, 34 trillion. Uh, and um, I saw Peter sending around this morning that uh, even the New York Times suddenly is admitting that the debt matters again. Um, we, you know, creating, uh, don't, don't create insane protectionist trade barriers that mess up supply chains or let the money printer go burr endlessly to fund political projects for special interest groups. Take, let's take a hard look at federal agencies, even ones that have been around for a long time and like seriously ask, is there some other way to do this? Uh, and then we just need someone on the national stage with the charisma and talent to actually persuade people and win an election. Easy peasy. That's my uh, wait. If the secret to electing libertarians is for everything to go really badly and for it's not. us to have a, a currency crisis <laughs> and way too much uh, debt it's not. and. Yeah. See, this is this this I think this is a, a little split here between um, what you're saying about Malay and uh, what Catherine always tells us, which is the way to make things better is not to have them get worse. And it, well, Zach that, is, that Zach is, is offering I'm the smartest. Yeah, I'm saying True. we need yes. to step in with Malay. Like we we need to somehow uh, sh- show people that we don't want to get 
to the point of Argentina bef- because th- then then uh, it's going to be real. The fix is going to look real ugly. Uh, we want to uh, apply these uh, lessons before we get to 100 percent inflation. Zach, the, Zach the, is doing the Christmas Carol version of this. Like he doesn't yes. he doesn't want to get to the dark future. He wants like the ghosts to come and visit us. Malay and... is the ghost of Christmas future. Yes, that's right. Yeah. The very boring version of this is all those old CBO reports that were just like, you know, these problems are easier to fix if you try to fix them earlier. And then right. nobody tried That's to do that. That's some New Year's resolution energy right, right. there. Uh, so for my lesson for the coming year, uh, based on the past year, um, I don't know if anyone else saw the remarks by former NIH director Francis Collins that were making the rounds over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but they were actually from the summer. But he basically said... Public health experts got it wrong in some notable ways during the pandemic by focusing exclusively on their narrow area of expertise and prioritizing things that they thought would save even one life over everything else. Uh, they were they they put in place um, and recommended some bad policies by because they were thinking far too narrowly about their own uh, about their own expertise. And so I think that is you know. That is a lesson that people have started to learn uh, in 2023. I think we saw Francis Collins saying stuff like this. We saw in the Gavin Newsom versus Ron DeSantis debate, Gavin Newsom trying to escape the label of lockdowner by label by saying that uh, DeSantis was actually the one who had locked down hardest, right? And that's that's basically good. But I, what I want is for people to to take that and apply it to 2024, not just in terms of lockdowns, not just in terms of mandates, not just in terms of, well, if there's another pandemic, but in a more general way, because the type of error that was made here was a general kind of category error of thinking that experts can remake society overnight on a whim based on their expertise. And it doesn't work and it creates really bad problems. And so next time all the experts and all the people in charge have a grand plan to fix everything right now by by uh, reorganizing the whole world, let's maybe not do that. Okay, so we're going to do a lightning round uh, uh, here to end our, our 2024 section. Uh, I want to talk about your goals and resolutions for 2024, either for yourself or and this is the uh, this is for Catherine because I know you don't make resolutions for yourself. You can also make a resolution for someone else. So please feel free to make resolutions for Nick for excuse me to make resolutions for Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch specifically, but also you know Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Elizabeth Warren, Josh Hawley. Catherine, uh, I'll make a cheaters resolution for this podcast as a whole, which is that uh, we should we're going to resolve to make this into a video podcast in 2024. Um, we are practicing right now as we speak uh, with our cameras, and soon you will be able to see rather than only hear every time I roll my eyes during this podcast. Love a resolution that is actually an advertisement. Zach, what is your resolution? Well, since we're entering an election year, uh, the discourse is likely to get really warped and polluted by partisan nonsense, people just saying whatever they think they need to say to boost their candidates or tear down the other side. So I want to resolve uh, to double down on not doing that and just trying to engage in the best version uh, of opposing argument, engage with the best version of opposing arguments, you know, not straw manning, not in- insulting, getting, and, and very importantly, not getting bogged down in arguments with people who are engaged in that kind of bad faith stuff. So this is, uh, I'll smuggle in my own advertisement. It's something Liz Wolf and I are both trying to do on our wow. new <laughs> weekly podcast, just asking <laughs> questions, which I hope a lot of the round table listeners will give a try. And just something I want to do online and in person as much as possible. That's a good resolution for other people is to listen to your podcast or show. Liz? <laughs> uh, mine is also an ad. Sorry. Oh my uh, God. Right? You know, I was, uh, I, I could, my other ones are boring, like read more books. Like, okay. So, so I'm going to do an ad. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I did the Reason Roundup for like five years, the Reasons Morning Newsletter, and then uh, recently handed it off to Liz Wolf. Thank you for your and service. And I'm going to have, 
Yeah, and I'm going to have my own uh, new newsletter launching soon, which is going to be specifically focused on like sex and tech policy and, and speech issues. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to sort of like really hunker down on, on more beat specific writing and just be doing like much more blogging in the sex policy and tech policy realm um, and covering that stuff in a much more like intensive way than I have gotten to in, in previous years. Hey, if our listeners have any ideas for what to name that, that would be really helpful. We're really struggling. Not the dongle, because everyone wants to call it the dongle. I, so I want to call it the that. dongle, but I do not. All but right, we're so, not going so to. we're going to resolve to not call it the dongle. I am once again going to call an audible here, since you guys have covered my resolution ideas. And you know what my resolution is? Ten pull-ups. That's it. Ten pull-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, that's with that, we are going to get on to our sponsor. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. You've all heard the saying, new year, new you. But maybe you should be thinking the opposite of that, or at least something a little bit more manageable. Around New Year's, we tend to become obsessed with how to change ourselves uh, instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. Maybe you're getting to the gym three times a week, but you really want to work on your pull-ups. Maybe you're a journalist who's finally getting your M dashes right, and now you want to get your state abbreviations correct, too. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. Therapy can help you learn positive coping skills, how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It isn't just for those who have experienced major trauma or have serious emotional problems. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist. Switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash roundtable today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. All right. So we're going to call this next uh, segment Service Journalism because it is about state-funded services. This is our reader question. Jesse L. writes, hello, Knights of the Roundtable. You talk frequently about the different options for government services, such as high-tax, high-service states like California, New York, and New Jersey, versus low-tax, low-service states like Florida and Texas. I am a New Jersey resident, and I have spent the last week in Florida. Good for you, by the way. Uh, maybe this is just anecdotal, but Florida blows New Jersey out of the water in terms of services. For instance, when my Bergen County roads look like they're actually in Bakhmut, the Collier County roads are freshly paved. The, the playgrounds are superior. They have sunshades. They're they are equal or greater. Uh, there's better trash picking, pickup or recycling than in my boroughitis town. So what exactly is Florida doing so much better to provide the kind of daily services I actually want to consume? Zach, you are our resident Florida man. Let's go to you. What's Florida doing better than New Jersey? Well, first, let me just completely validate what Jesse is saying. I immediately noticed when I moved from L.A. to Florida, oh, wow, the roads don't have a pothole every five miles and tree roots aren't pushing up and cracking the sidewalks everywhere. And the parks are pretty nice. And so are the schools. And, uh, you know, if I, I, I if I can just take some of those examples one by one, uh, we covered some of this in the Florida issue, but uh, the roads, especially the highways, I think work pretty well because Florida's government has put into practice many of the ideas that Bob Poole, Reason Foundation's transportation policy director, has advocated for a long time, like uh, variable price toll lanes. So like, you know, the price goes up and down when, uh, depending on how much traffic there is. So that not only makes the traffic flow better, but it actually funds the road improvements and expansions as they're needed. And the people actually using the roads are the ones paying for that. Um, you know, Florida also about a decade ago rejected a uh, high speed rail proposal that got really close. Um, and that money uh, is, has been able to go towards, I think, more useful transportation infrastructure now. And Florida, ironically, now is beating California to a semi high speed rail with a privately funded project called Brightline. Um, which has seen pretty good ridership so far and um, is recently expanded. And even if it does fail as it expands, at least the taxpayers don't have to be on the hook the way California's botched high speed rail project has. Um, and then with schools, you know, we've got a lot of school choice, including just 
giving parents money if they want to send their kids to a private school. And that's cre created a nice marketplace of schools here and also relieved some of the overcrowding that has a pressure that's happened as a lot of young families have moved here. Um, and overall, I think it has to do with a couple things. One is, you know, in California, there's a very entrenched political class um, that has a grip on governance there. And I imagine that I don't know much about New Jersey politics, but I imagine it's a similar situation here. There, uh, here, um, for a long time, Florida has been more politically competitive. That's changed somewhat in the DeSantis era, and we'll see what effects that has down the road. Um, but, you know, having to actually, you know, be a little more responsive to the voters, I think, helps. Uh, and then also, I think I do think it's like just all the retirees that have always flocked to Florida forever. They want to have nice amenities. They want things well maintained. And that's always been, been a big part of Florida's appeal. And um, Florida's state laws have helped enable that by devolving a lot of the maintenance infrastructure down to the local levels, which sometimes even involves creating these hyper local special districts or even just letting a private developer take care of stuff that the public sector usually would take care of. So just a very different mindset. Things aren't perfect, obviously, but it is true that many things just seem to work better on the like municipal services level. Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I think Zach, Zach is exactly right. Um, and if you want more on this, you can, of course, also go listen to Nick Gillespie's great interview with Jeb Bush, Jeb, yes. who has some thoughts about Florida on this question. Um, but I also think there's just the, you know, there's the question of uh, what services do people see and what services do they value? Um, and I think that in many states, the concept of what a service even is has gotten completely unmoored from the user experience right so you know i think like denver would say that it is providing like a very high level of service when it comes to zoning and like building approval like they're really doing the most to protect the quality of neighborhoods and the green space in the city or whatever um places that pay to attract stadiums not that that's a super specific example that's super relevant to where i live right now or anything but um people that pay to attract stadiums are going to say like well this is a service that we're providing and uh and look people can see it and they like it um so you know i think roads are a classic there's a reason that when people object to libertarians general worldview they say but what about the roads because roads are important to people especially in this country. Where I think we are they very say very specifically, my roads, my roads. Yeah. Roads. yeah. Um, especially in this country where uh, people are very car oriented. Um, but um, I think in some ways what we're really talking about here is just states that are more in touch with what their users, what their citizens actually want versus what they think they should want or should have. Um, all these states are providing what they perceive to be services, but some of them are uh, at least to my mind, not services nearly so much as they are shackles. Uh, so the thing that I would add related to what uh, both Catherine and Zach said here is that when it comes to government programs, the expensive stuff is high touch social services. Now, that includes education. Um, because education is a very sort of uh, person uh, person power intensive, right? It's it's uh, especially if you want small classrooms, um, but also health and welfare type programs, and that is what Florida does an awful lot less of. So let's do one final lightning round segment here on another Florida man, uh, but his experience in different states. Since the last time we taped the roundtable, a few things have happened in the news, and one of those is that courts in Colorado and Maine banned Donald Trump from their 2024 presidential ballots. The reason is because the 14th Amendment, which says that certain public offices cannot be held by individuals who participated in an insurrection or something insurrection-like, and the courts in both of those states ruled that that includes Donald Trump and the presidency. So we're going to call this final segment, Democracy is Off the Ballots. Catherine, is taking Trump off the ballot good for democracy? Nope. 
I don't think so. I do not think that he would be a good second term president, but I don't think that that is the question at issue here. And in fact, there are at least two other questions at issue. One is what even is an insurrection and did Trump participate in one? And two is even if he did, does uh, Section 3 apply to him? Um, I think this it is very, very likely that the Supreme Court will end up resolving this on uh, on the last token, if I had to guess, that they will sort of say um, the presidential oath doesn't really qualify under Section 3 or something like that, thus getting to um, what I actually think is the correct outcome in terms of uh, avoiding f- further insurrections or other political unrest, um, which is that it will go back to the place it should have been all along, which is to the people to decide whether Donald Trump should be president again. We just can't have a large number of random government officials deciding what is or isn't insurrection. Like the Civil War, like that one's clear. Um, and, you know, I think that just in general in our in our founding. To you anyway. Yeah. In, <laughs> to, yeah. <laughs> Um, just in general, in our founding documents, in our kind of key formational texts for the nation, like you have to remember that these were written under specific circumstances. So we also just have stuff in there that was like kind of specifically to like keep Alexander Hamilton from being president or like just to keep like <laughs> some of these assholes that tried to, you know, form a confederacy out of office. Um, it doesn't, you know, th- those rules oughtn't be there, oughtn't be used in the most expansive definition possible to allow uh, a cadre of powerful people to make decisions in lieu of the general public, particularly with respect to elections, which are built for the general public to decide. Yeah, I was fairly convinced by an op-ed in The New York Times by Kurt Lash that walked through the wording of the specific clause in the 14th Amendment and showed how ambiguous it is and then argued that Trump shouldn't be removed from ballots based on a dicey reading of an ambiguous provision. Uh, It it would be one thing if the Constitution were very extremely clear on this, but it's not. And in the absence of clarity, Trump should be allowed on the ballot. Let's go to our final segment here. What have you been consuming? What did you read, watch, otherwise engage with over the holiday break? Zach, let's start with you. Uh, I watched uh, Todd Haynes' latest movie, May, December, which stars Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman and explores a problematic age gap relationship. Uh, And I don't mean that in the way that it's become used with like a 25 year old and a 40 year old. I mean, a woman who had an affair with the seventh grader and then had his kid and then married him. Um, And it's apparently loosely based on a real scandal. Um, Very loosely, but yes. Yeah, very loosely based. And um, there's some incredible performances from those two actresses and directing and obviously really disturbing material. But what I liked about it is this extra layer where you're seeing it all through the eyes of an outsider, Natalie Portman, who playing playing an actress who's studying to play Julianne Moore's character in a TV movie and she's just trying to figure out, like, first, what the hell is actually going on with this relationship and how not to portray it in a really cheesy, salacious way. And then you're thinking, watching it, I'm like, wait, um, is me watching this actually salacious and, you know, a bit of head games going on there? Um, but it's so well done that it then inspired me to go back to one of Todd Haynes' earlier films, which is called Safe. And despite being made in 1995 and set in 1987, it feels somehow even more relevant to today uh, than um, May, December, because it's about a woman who becomes sick with some unknown condition and then is convinced that it's the modern world around her that's poisoning her and then kind of retreats into this unplugged Oasis slash cult, and then there's a lot this of was masking. Before there was even Wi-Fi in the air. What's that? This was before there was even Wi-Fi in the air. Exactly. Yeah, the Wi-Fi, the 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 EMF attacks are not even on on the agenda at this point. But you know, um, there's just a lot of fear of chemicals and modern medicine, and you know, something for everyone. So I started a Todd Haynes bender, and maybe you should too. I loved. May, December. It is such a delightfully complicated movie psychologically. And it yeah. it does 
It does a great job with difficult subject matter, but even more than that is it does a great job of showing how even extremely psychologically astute people don't know themselves and hide things from themselves. And it's a movie about that the gap between your perception of yourself and your actual self. And it just gets at the at the difficulty of even knowing the uh, of knowing anyone, including yourself, I think better than almost anything else uh, I've seen in in many years. Um, Liz. What is your cultural consumption? I've been listening to this album that I uh, got. My, my husband is, is Thai American. Um, and he, so I got him this album. It's called um, Thai Dai, like Thai question mark, Dai D-A-I, yes. which I guess means yes in Thai. Um, the heavier side of the Luk Tong underground. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. But um, it's a compilation of uh, Thai funk and rock and surf tunes from the from the 60s. Um, and it was, it's originally released in 2011. It's based on this like Bangkok dance night that they've been, that they've been holding there or that they used to hold there at least, um, that these two DJs found based like old records, digging this stuff up and unearthing it and playing it at this dance night. And then they, they compiled this album based on it. Um, it's just a really interesting sound They're you know, singing in Thai and there's this sort of Thai, um, instrumentation going on, but it's over these quintessentially American or British like surf rock and psych rock beats um and it's it's just it's a lot of fun and it's really interesting i i was i've previously been into like really into um thai gogo and iranian gogo music and this is sounds <laughs> a lot like that kind i mean very different but it's it hits that same sort of spot um which just makes you think like yay cultural appropriation is is beautiful um and yeah it's it's fun you can you can listen to it for free on Bandcamp and they also uh sell it there and, so um, so DC on. is kind of the home of go go music and you sometimes walk just a, a, across town and there are big people with big speakers out just playing go go on the streets um and all but also famously DC uh, was a, a great punk rock town and one of the one of DC's most famous punk rock bands is Fugazi which basically blended uh, sort of early 1980s New York style punk rock with go-go beats. And so now I'm wondering, who is the Thai Fugazi? They're on this album, probably. I guess I'm going to have to listen. Yeah, probably. The, the, I cannot pronounce their name, but they are on this album. All right. I, I'm looking forward to this now. Um, Catherine, what did you consume you over know, the break? I was just sitting here laughing because that is like such a Liz Nolan Brown recommendation, like the deepest of cuts, the hipsterist of takes. Um, but then I realized but also personal, but and also about personal her and full of. Awesome. So but then I realized that I am sitting here inside my glass house and should not throw stones because my recommendation is also a real KMW cliche. Um, I read a book called Index, comma, a history of the. And it is a book, a whole book about indexes. It's a whole book about indexes. And it's great. This book is going to be my whole personality for like about a month. So get ready to be sick of me. Um, the It's by Dennis Duncan. Uh, and it was recommended to me by uh, Dominic Pino of National Review, who mentioned it in passing while we were literally in a bookstore. And I was like, I can't even wait to find out if this book is in this bookstore. I just bought it on my phone from Amazon right away because I was so excited about it. Among other things, this book explores the fear that overtook people upon the invention of the index that people would stop reading properly if they had the option to just look stuff up in the index. So this is one of the earliest tech panics. Um, and uh, in fact, there's an insult that people used against each other. Uh, index raker is the word for someone who is just going to check the index for the relevant passages and not read the book as its author intended. Um, you cannot have indexes until you have codexes. That is, you can't have indexes until you have sort of bound books with page numbers. Um, making an index to a scroll is a deeply unsatisfying activity. Um, so uh, this, of course, overlaps, interestingly, with just generally the kind of popularization of books, the wider availability of books. Um, but like just when you thought you knew about all of the tech panics, I am here to bring you index panic. So I, I like that you discovered this book while in a bookstore with another writer because the index, of course, gave rise to the possibility 
of the thing that we know as the, the Washington, Washington Reed, Reed yes. which is where you go into a bookstore and don't read the book at all. You just look for your own name in yes. the back of the book. Um, I did not look for my own name in this book. I did look for Adam Smith in this book because, as I have said on this podcast before, I think Adam Smith is one of the great index makers of history. He doesn't even get a mention, but this book is so good, I will forgive it. Uh, the index does have in itself a running joke in which... Um, it drags you through the index using words that are synonyms for wild goose chase from the beginning of the index to the end with cross references. That's so annoying. It's so good. It's so good. Um, uh, one last tidbit, again, because I'm not going to shut up about this book, is that um, it explores the idea that it is not actually intuitive to use the alphabet to organize things. Like, that was an intellectual leap. Like you have this list of letters, but it's just a list of letters. You could organize things all kinds of ways. And the the intellectual leap of using alphabetical order as a general way to impose order on the world is something that I had never once in my life thought about. And um, it's a pretty cool thing that humans did. I, I do. I have come to appreciate a good index in a cocktail book because a good cocktail book has multiple indexes. They organize by drink by uh, ingredient or base spirit, and then also by things like, you know, name or, or place of origin or, or bar or that sort of thing, right? A, a more conventional index of proper na- uh, proper nouns that have been named. But from a cocktail book, you want a lot more than that. You want sort of, oh, I, I, I'm uh, mixing stuff with rum today. Let me just see all of the recipes that are related to rum. You sound like a depraved index raker, Suterman. Well, sometimes <laughs> when you're reading, a, when, you, you want to read the whole book first, but sometimes you haven't read the book in a couple of years and you need to remember what which page. What is the uh, digital equivalent of that insult? Is it like the control F or something like that? So this oh. book is objectively pro control F, which is interesting. Okay. Like they basically say, uh, like there's this beautiful index at the end, but it says if you're reading this in a digital edition, just use the search function. Yeah. So there should be a, a a digital version of this insult for people who don't watch television shows, but just read the Wikipedia summary. Speaking of which, I watched season three of Slow Horses on Apple TV. It is just great. It features a fat, drunken, long haired, mean spirited and utterly miserable Gary Oldman leading a team of spy rejects in the British intelligence service. Uh, in every season, what you see is that the biggest danger actually comes from the bureaucrats at the top. Because the bureaucrats running the show are really just politicians. And politicians in this show's worldview are just self-absorbed status monsters who only care about their own power. Also, the show is really surprisingly funny and really smartly plotted. And Gary Oldman is just so delightfully mean. And I am so happy with this show. Uh, That is it for today, folks. If you like our work, you can support us by going to reason.com slash donate. Matt Welch will be back in the driver's seat next week. Happy New Year, 